it's time to turn some red cedar. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. Today I'm going to turn this beautiful piece of cedar into a nice big round bowl, hopefully. Now this cedar has been in my shed for several years. I harvested this from a hurricane a few years back and it's been drying. This wood is absolutely beautiful and it's going to look really good with a high sheen finish. I'm going to finish this hopefully with lacquer and we're going to see what that looks like. Now, I do have a little bit of concern because I've got, I don't know what this is. It's kind of like a rot or it's, it's some kind of decomposition happening with the red cedar I have. They all have this little bit of veins of broken material in there. I'm not seeing bugs and critters in there, but the wood's leaving some holes. So I'm going to have to deal with those. So it's going to make this turning a little bit interesting and we'll have to address that down the road. So let's go ahead and get started and see what we get. Okay, so we're gonna cut this on the bandsaw into a cylinder so it'll be easier to turn on the lathe. Now you could put a log like this on the lathe, but you're gonna spend a lot of extra time and kind of take a beating knocking down those corners. You don't have to cut this on the bandsaw. The bandsaw is basically just a convenience and take your time. I've tried to keep a zone of about five inches where my hand never gets within five inches of that blade. If you notice, I'm actually pivoting around the pin that's holding the disc in, t in the top of the blank. I keep that pin about a 90 degree angle off to the side of the blade. Okay, so now that we have our cylinder, we'll move over to the lathe. I'm gonna mount this between centers. I've got a four spur drive center that I'll put on the headstock and I'll pull up the tail stock. And if you're not already subscribing to my channel, please consider it. I've got a ton of videos and a ton more coming your way. You're gonna to wanna to be notified when those come out. Okay, it's pretty balanced there. It's looking pretty good. You can see those holes on the sides. All right, before I get started, I'm going to sharpen my bowl gouge. You always want to start with a sharp tool, and you're, I'm going to be sharpening throughout this turning. If you're curious about how to sharpen all of your turning equipment, check out my tool sharpening online e-course. I cover everything you're going to need to know for every tool that you'll use while turning a wood bowl. Okay, so I'm going to get my 5 8 inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. And I'm going to use that to start roughing this. If you notice, I'm kind of getting bounced around there a little bit. And I, that happened because I initially wasn't applying pressure down on the tool rest. Because we have an uneven surface that's coming around at the moment, that bull gouge has got a tendency to want to get kicked around. But if you apply good downforce to the tool rest, it'll stabilize your cutting path and you won't have the bull gouge get knocked around quite as much. So I'm going to round off these corners just to start shaping this and get this into a more smooth bull shape. Notice how I'm pointing the bull gouge in the direction of the cut. In this case, I'm moving from right to left and I have the bull gouge posi positioned at about the 10 o'clock position. If the bull gouge flute was straight up and that was 12 o'clock, I'm pointing to the left around 10 o'clock. Now I'm gonna go across the center to smooth off this, the main center area. Some bark material there and I wanna clean out of the way so we can make the tenon. I try to get to the tenon as quickly as possible because once the tenon and the shoulders are established, I have one of the connecting points of the overall shape of the bowl established. So in other words, once I've formed the tenon and the shoulder, I know exactly where the base of the bowl will be. And then I just need to connect the base with the rim of the bowl 
to develop the shape of the bowl. I'm going to use my dividers to mark the width of my four jaw chuck and the width that the tenon will be. And then I just do a, a real light push cut to clear away the material across that space. Now, this is Eastern Red Cedar. And Eastern Red Cedar is pretty hard. It, on the Jenka hardness chart, it is 900. There's a Western Red Cedar, and its Jenka hardness is only around 300. So that could be a little bit deceiving though, because it sounds like it's, it's a pretty solid wood. And actually black cherry has a Jenka hardness around 900 as well. So this Eastern red cedar and black cherry have a hardness that are almost the same. However, this red cedar has different characteristics the strength of the wood and the weight of the wood are very light compared to black cedar. For instance, if this were a black cedar blank in the lathe right now, I would be turning much slower because that blank is, would be very heavy. This blank is very lightweight compared to black cherry. It's also, the material is more brittle it has, I don't know how to explain it. It's, uh, it's probably like a tensile strength thing. It's probably, an, if, if you're an engineer, you probably know this. It's probably the tensile strength or the, um, the ability for the, the wood to flex. This, this is brittle and it cracks very easily. So I need to be aware of that while I'm turning. Then the, the rot that's occurring on the sides of this bowl blank are actually, it's going right through the center of the heartwood is, is rather odd because I'm not seeing any critters. It doesn't look like it's insect trails like I've seen in other timber. It's almost as if that area or that tunnel of wood just kind of dried up and shriveled in on itself and fell out. There you can see it pretty well. I've got a couple low spots there, so I'm going to go ahead and round out the side of this bull blank. Just going to get down to where I have an even cylinder, so I have a starting point, or at least I know where the my level surface is. The rim of this is very uneven, so I'm going to scrape that down so I can also determine where the top of the bowl will be. And this will be a simple pass. Remember, when you're cutting with a bowl gouge, you're moving your body weight. You're not moving your hands or your arms. If we move our hands and arms, we're going to have so much movement in that you'll never get a straight line. I still have a low spot. Wow, those holes are big. I've got that low spot right there I need to deal with. So I need to take the whole surface down to that low spot. To make a smooth cut with a bowl gouge, what what I'm doing right now is I'm pressing down into the tool rest so that the tool doesn't vibrate. And I'm holding my hands and my arms up against my body. I'm holding my hands stationary and I'm simply leaning my body weight by flexing my knees. That's all I'm doing. And I'm just shifting my body weight forward so the bowl gouge glides through the material. Okay, so I've taken quite a bit of material out there and what I want to do is just quickly remove some more material here to merge those areas, that bottom curve with this side panel. This is a pulling cut and I'm using just the bottom wing of the bull gouge to quickly rough that material out. That particular cut is not going to leave a smooth finish, but it will quickly remove the material. Okay, so here you can see the shape of the bull. And now I'm going to take a little bit more time and I'm going to make a smoother cut, a grain supported cut. I've got a video all about supported grain direction and it's a super critical thing that you need to know about when turning bowls. So check out that video when you get a chance after you've seen this one because you're going to want to totally understand the grain direction. Understanding the grain direction and the proper direction to cut will save you so much time with sanding and so much frustration with 
torn out ingrain fibers. If you're cutting against the supported grain, you're probably getting some really bad torn out ingrain. Okay, here I'm just doing a real simple pulling shear scrape to connect the area of the shoulder to the base of the bowl. You can see me tipping my head up there. I'm actually watching, I'm watching where I'm at with the tool, of course, but I'm looking up across that bowl because I want to see the overall shape of the bowl. So the bottom portion is, is getting close. Now I'm going to pick up that cut. I'm just going to rub the bowl gouge bevel on the space before the cut and just gently introduce the cutting edge and regain that cut. Now I'm at the apex of that curve. This bowl is going to have a slightly closed lid or opening, the rim rather. And if you saw my supported cut video, you know the, you probably understand the trick question. You can see I'm moving from the rim down in this case, and I'm moving actually up to the apex or the highest point of this particular bowl. You just take your time and make light, smooth cuts and level out that material. Now I do have a little bit of a ridge in the center, so I'm gonna use the shear scrape to minimize that and merge those areas together. The more you drop your handle, the less severe the slice will be. It's almost like shaving. This is a great technique to use just to smooth off the surface. And as you might guess, I have a video all about that, so check that out too. You can see those real fine shavings that are produced from that. Okay, so we've got the exterior of the bowl turned. Let's go ahead and take the, the four spur drive center out and I'm gonna use my four jaw chuck and we'll mount that tenon right to the chuck. Now I'm gonna bring the tailstock up for a little extra support. I kinda of wanna quickly hog out the interior of this and get some some of the meat, meat out of this bowl and then I will move, remove the tailstock and do some more lighter refining cuts on the interior of this bowl. So what I'm dealing with are, are tunnels that are going through the interior of this bowl blank. And I'm a little concerned, I, I just sped the lathe up, I, I'm a little concerned that those tunnels are going to create a catch or give me some kind of issue inside here and I want to be cautious with this. I also have to keep in mind that this wood is very brittle and there is a possibility of of the tenon shearing off. And typically with the tailstock in place, we've got a little bit extra security in keeping the bull blank on the lathe. Typically. <laughs> there went our tenon and we still have a portion of the tenon in the four jaw chuck but the bull has left the lathe let's take a look at this again in slow motion right here I created a catch and again the tailstock has nothing to do with the lathe right now or with the turning other than some added support the bull blank should have been supported by the tenon in the four jaw chuck. Okay, well, that was unexpected and we'll just, we'll just uh, chuck that tenon and let's make another one. 
If you're liking this video, you could really help me out by clicking that like button below the screen right now. Yeah, go ahead and click that like button. I greatly appreciate you doing that. Thank you. So I need to clear out the, some of this stub in the center so I have a flat location. I'm kind of eyeballing the center of this. I want to try to line that back up. I'm going to take my time and just really carefully line up the center of that. And hopefully I can get this lined up again and bring the tailstock up. And we're just going to keep moving forward. I realize having a big piece like this go flying off the lathe is a little bit unnerving, but as you can see there, it wasn't horrible. I My body was out of the line of fire, so it essentially shot right past me. And that's why you typically don't want to stand right in front of the turning. There's going to be times when you pretty much have to, but for the majority of the time, you want to be off to the side like you see me doing right now. Okay, so I'm using small push cuts towards the headstock to level off this torn away old tenon. And then I'm just going to nibble down again with push cuts towards the headstock and create a new tenon. Also, this, this area was sapwood, the lighter white kind of cream colored wood is sapwood on the outside of the wood. It's usually not as strong as the heartwood, but with Eastern red cedar, it's pretty evenly brittle throughout. So I don't know that I would have had much better luck if it were all heartwood versus the sapwood. Okay, so I'm just pushing in and doing some push cuts to establish the tenon in the shoulder again, and I'm going to remove some of the base of this bowl. I need to reestablish the bottom curve of the bowl since we're eating away a little more of the material now. I'm just using a quick little pull cut here to remove that curve. I'm also wearing my respirator throughout this entire turning because this wood is very dry and it creates a, a very fine dust, so I don't need to be breathing in that that dust. All right, now I'm using my spindle detail gouge to create the undercut dovetail angle for the four jaw chuck. And I think what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to put some super fine CA right along the edge of this tenon. And this will hopefully give it a little extra bonding with the bowl so we don't see separation quite as easily. I'm going to hit that with a little CA accelerator that helps the glue dry quickly. And then I'm going to run the spindle detail gouge into that corner one more time because I want to make sure I've got a good clean corner in there that will seat well into the four jaw chuck. And then I'm going to continue merging that curve into the previous curve. What I'm doing is a really light cut here and I'm going to just bring those lines together and just let that come out of the cut. So it essentially merges the new curve with the old curve. And we're going to use a shear scrape to smooth out that area. The shear scrape wasn't quite grabbing there. And what you can do in that case is just drop the handle a little, little bit. You should be at about a 45 degree angle. We're just using the lower wing of the bull gouge here for that scraping cut. Okay, so we've gone back and made a second tenon on this bowl. And I've got this extended nub here. So I'm going to go ahead and chisel that off, get that out of the way so that tenon will seat into the four jaw chuck. Let's try this again. <laughs> All right, I'm bringing the tailstock up again for support. I don't know how much it's going to help me this time. I'm going to clean up that rim. Well, you can see that tunnel there how deep that is inside the wood and it's coming right up to the rim. So I'm going to have to address that. 
I'm starting to question the quality of this wood. All right, so I'm making push cuts in towards the headstock. There should be a little less stress on the tenon. But remember, the farther away from the center of this that I'm working, the more leverage I have too. So if I push really hard on that outside, it's gonna cause a lot of stress on the tenon. So I really need to take it easy out on that outside edge. So I'm gonna work down and establish my wall thickness. As you probably know from some of my other videos, I like establishing the wall thickness first and maintaining that mass in the center because it gives me a little extra stability. Got a lot of that materials coming out, which is good. We're gonna to have to fill it and address it. Sometimes one or two small holes in a bowl are kind of interesting, and if they're up towards the top of the rim, they don't cause too much of a problem, but these are pretty large and extensive, so I'm going to need to do something to fill them to address that. Now I'm working a small way down the wall on the inside to establish that wall thickness, and then I'm removing some of the center mass. This bowl blank is nice and dry, so I don't have to worry about the wet wood in a green wood turning flexing so much, but you still can have flexing with a bowl, especially a bowl this size, once that whole center is removed. And especially because the wood is not continuous, I have those big holes and gaps in here, so there can be sections of this that flex, and I need to be cautious with that. So the way I do this is I nibble material away from the center to create, I like to call it a ditch. It's like a small little area next to the interior wall. And then I'll work down the wall, just kind of nibble into that and sneak up on the wall thickness. I don't want to make big cuts here and all of a sudden have an area down into the bowl where the wall is thinner than up towards the rim. Instead, I want a nice even wall thickness all the way throughout. So the way to do that is you just sort of sneak up on that thickness. Stop frequently and determine what the wall thickness is and how much you need to remove. If you get too aggressive here, you can remove too much too quickly and then you have some issues to deal with. Very light cuts and just taking off very thin layers until you get to the ideal wall thickness. I'm being pretty cautious here because I don't want to add a lot of extra stress on that tenon and make this thing go flying again. When it flew off the first time, the whole center was intact and solid. So it bounced a little bit and probably got scratched up. I didn't even really look. It probably got dinged up, but I knew that I was going to turn away some of that exterior and, and any blemishes would be dealt with. But if it comes off the lathe now with that wall thickness, even at about a half inch or 12 millimeters around, it's probably going to break those side walls and we don't want that. Making these concentric circles is kind of hypnotizing at times. That last little bit is can be difficult to get the gouge to engage. You can see that big gaping hole there. I don't know. I thought this was pretty interesting wood to turn when I started. Now I'm really questioning it. I 
I'm making relatively light passes here. If this were any other wood and I knew the tenon was stable and secure, I would be much more aggressive here and I would hog out that material a lot quicker. Instead, I'm being pretty cautious. There you can see how I'm just sneaking up on that wall thickness. Very, very light passes, probably a millimeter or less. Now this form, or the shape of this bowl, has a closed rim. And what that means is the rim is narrower than the widest por part of some portion of the bowl. Now what I'm gonna do here is before I take away that full center, I'm gonna to try to turn down past all of these big holes. There don't seem to be any big holes in the base of this, which is really good, because I obviously don't want anything down in the bottom of this bowl. But the sidewalls have holes on both sides. I wanna make sure that I've got a relatively even wall thickness down around those, and then I'm going to work on patching those holes. And then I'll bring this back to the lathe and then work from there. But before I can patch those holes, I need to make sure they're all exposed properly. So the way you know you've got a closed rim bowl is all of the shavings are trapped in the bowl while you're turning. The, the shavings will go to the lowest point in the bowl and the lowest point is the widest point of the bowl also. And they don't, not all of them escape the bowl. So they're trapped inside there and not until you stop the lathe and pull them out will they come out. You can see them on the left side of the interior there. It's all filled with shavings. I'm, I'm going, I'm cutting right over those holes and I'm a little bit cautious that if I get one of those to catch and snag that again, I'm going to go flying off the lathe with the bull blank. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now what I'm using here is a dental pick. All the tools I use in this video, I'll put links to them in the description for this video. So check those out. Everything that you're seeing me use, I will have a link for. Uh, basically, these are dental picks and I'm using these to remove any loose material in these holes. And I'm also finding soft material that I can mm -hmm. dig out. Don't want any loose material there because if I fill these holes and there's still loose material, that loose material may come loose and knock out the filler that I put in there. Okay, so I'm gonna fill from the outside. So I'm gonna secure the backside of each of these holes. And I'm using gaffer's tape. This is a very strong tape. It's different than duct tape. It's a little bit more adhesive and it, I just, it's a, it's a great tape. I love having it around. I use it for a variety of different things. Now I've got these edges. I've got, I've got holes along the rim of the bowl, and I'm going to use some scrap little pieces of wood about the size of popsicle sticks, and I'm going to tape those in place along the rim to act as a, a like a dam for the resin when I fill that rim. There's a lot of holes in this bowl. Okay, I don't know what I was thinking here, but I, I used my, my technique of creating a little workspace with some masking tape, and I use equal parts. This is five minute epoxy, and I use equal parts of part A and part B, and then I like to use a mica color blend, and this is a turquoise. What I'll do is I'll take that turquoise and I'll blend it into the epoxy as I'm stirring it up. But what I don't realize, what I, I don't know what I was thinking was the fact that I made this little batch here. And this is what I usually, this is probably a normal big batch for filling a hole of some sort. But for what I have on this bowl, what I'm mixing right now will barely cover anything. But I'll deal with, I'll deal with that in just a minute.
So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm basically just working into the hole and then I'm going to take the popsicle stick and I'm going to make sure that I've got resin and all of the surfaces inside that that hole so that it adheres well to that to that whole space. But like I said, I don't even have enough resin to fill this one hole with this mix that I just made. So I'm going to need to mix more in a larger batches. So I'm going to move to cups. I'm going to mix little cups of resin. And there's my little cup for the next batch. Okay, you can see how that one hole dried. And I've got a couple of them there that I've done. Basically, I've got about, it's and because it's so thick, it's taking longer than five minutes. It's about a 10 minute process before it tacks up. And I'm using the the index wheel on my lathe to pin this down and hold it in place. And obviously I'm working against gravity here, so I can only work the holes at the very top of the bowl. And if the, if the hole is not lined up perfectly, then the resin wants to run out of the hole. <laughs> And it's about 10 minutes, 10 minutes of dealing with the resin trying to run out of the hole before it sets up and it hardens. And then I can move on to the next set of holes. This is a very time consuming process. All of the time that you saw me turning prior, these holes took me about three times longer than that to get them all filled. Here's the hole that's right along the rim of the bowl. And you can see that little popsicle stick piece of wood that I'm using as a dam and the tape underneath it. So I'm going to pour that in there and fill that area. Yeah, so I had to come back to this. I, I would pour some, pour an area and then let it dry and then pour another area and let it dry. And then I'd come back and then fill the area completely in. Wow, it was very time consuming. I didn't realize how many holes there were in here. I ended up taking the bowl off the lathe. I left it in the chuck so that it's still seated on the tenon properly. And this way I can level off the holes a lot better. I can actually hold them level for as long as possible. And that gives me a little bit better opportunity than just on the lathe. Because I have the curve of the outside of that bowl, you can see right there how the epoxy is trying to run out of the hole. Well, I can tip the, the whole bowl up and make just that one area level. Yeah, and you, could, you have to mix matches that are exactly the size for the hole that you're using. It's not as if I can make a big batch and spend my time working on one hole then move to the next hole because the whole batch sets up in about five minutes, a little bit longer when it's thick like that. So <laughs> it's, it's one batch at a time, one hole at a time. And then I sit and hold it and wait for it to set up. It's somewhat torturous of a process. Here I tried to do the hole on the top, which is level, and the hole below it, which is not at the same plane. So the bottom hole is trying to run out. And I'm playing chase the resin on the bottom hole. The nice thing about doing the resin in a couple of batches though is I know that I've got a really good fill that is down in into the cavities really well. It's funny because you chase it like this for a little while then all of a sudden it just stops running and it sets up. Okay, so this has had time to dry overnight and cure. I decided to let it just go overnight and I'm going to put it back on the lathe. i got to remove all the tape that I can. These little pieces of wood that were used on the rim are bonded there, so they're going to have to be turned off. I'm a little concerned about getting a catch with those and that tenon again, but we'll see what happens. It just doesn't want to come off. It's going to make really light cut across that rim. You can feel it hit those pieces of wood. 
There we've got a good solid connection all the way across. It should be level. All right, that's actually looking pretty good. I've got a nice smooth flush surface along the rim. Now I need to address the wood and the resin on the exterior. I'm fine with the shape of the bowl. I don't want to try to reshape it. And obviously I have a wall thickness established. So I just want to nibble down and t shave away the top layer or so until I get down to clean wood with smooth resin surfaces. So I'm making really light cuts from right to left up to the apex of the exterior of the bowl. And that's actually turning out really nice. Okay, and I'm going to do a push cut from the base of the bowl up to the apex of the exterior. I'm just hoping there's not a big chunk of that resin that grabs the bowl gouge and causes a catch because we saw what happens with this wood when the tenon decides to give. Now, that's just a, an interesting thing I want to note too is that I'm using a pull cut here to scrape away some of that extra resin that poured down the side. I have never had a tenon in the four jaw chuck fail ever, except for what you just saw. I've had that happen with very dry, brittle pecan and it sheared off the tenon when it got a, a nasty catch like that. When I, I was being overly aggressive, removing material, and it, almost what happened, like what happened today, and the same, the same thing happened. It basically just bounced off and hit the floor. There was nothing super hazardous about it, and I had to turn a new tenon and remember to be a little bit more cautious. So if you're working with a very brittle wood, you're gonna to wanna to remember to take it easy on that tenon when you're, when you're turning. I'm using just light scrapes here to merge these high spots or take down these high spots. This is a sheer scrape. And that's looking real good. Yeah, I'm getting there. All right, I'm gonna sand the exterior of the bowl and then we'll continue on the interior of the bowl. You want to spot sand the trouble areas and level those out. If you see any scratches, things like that, you want to sand with the grain. And this is with the surface grain of the wood. And I used to, I sand with the edge of the sander on the surface grain so I'm not scratching and leaving scratches in the, sand, in the wood itself. All right, I've got two little hairline cracks in this sap wood. They're not structural and they're not gonna cause a problem, but I'm gonna use this really simple technique. I've taken some wood glue, press it down into the crack, and then I've got 150 grit sandpaper, and I just very quickly sand with the grain across that crack, and keep sanding until the crack basically disappears. I'm having a little trouble getting the sandpaper in the right position. There we go. And what's happening is the sandpaper friction is drying the glue. The little dust coming from the sanding is attaching to the top of the glue. So it basically camouflages the crack and the patch that you just made. It's a great technique for little cracks like this. And of course the glue's in there, it's gonna cure and it's gonna basically strengthen that area so that that crack will no longer be an opportunity for something else to occur down the line. So then I'll do all the, go through all the grits. If you want to learn about how I sand bowls, check out my sanding video. It's not super complicated, but there's some things you want to know to make it make the whole process easier for you and have good results as well okay now i'm in the inside and i know i've got some thick resin that i'm going to be coming up against again i want to make very light cuts and just take my time i'm not trying to do anything very aggressively here i just want to work in there and 
reestablish that wall thickness and make it even throughout. But it's smooth now, now that we have the holes filled. When you start on the edge like that, you want to make sure that your the edge of the bull gouge is at a 90 degree angle. If you have it at any other angle, you're going to get a skip back. And skip backs aren't fun because you're going to scratch up the rim most likely. When you come in here to pick up a previous cut, you can just drop the handle a little bit so that only the bevel is rubbing and then position the cutting edge right up to where the previous cut let off, left off and just lift the handle a touch to engage that cutting edge and you're right back into the previous track that you had. You can see the edge there where it's a little bit thicker inside the bowl. So I need to pick up there and then slowly creep up on that wall thickness and get it to match the rest of the rim. Now I'm cutting through these tunnels and I'm really, really concerned about getting a catch here because if I push too hard and I go into one of the tunnels too quickly, then all of a sudden the gouge is inside there and gets smacked with the opposite side, which creates a catch. And again, if we get a catch, this thing could go flying. And there you can see that tunnel that I'm working around. I basically need to shave that away completely so that's no longer part of the problem here. The other thing that's interesting with eastern red cedar is it creates a lot of branches. The trees create a lot of branches and those branches can position themselves almost randomly anywhere inside the wood. And there's a knot right in the center of this bowl. It's on the base and it's on in the core in here as well. So there's a branch that's going through here. So we've got a couple different grain directions and other tensions going on. So it doesn't want to cut super well in the center. So I'm just going to take my time, let the tool do the work, and try not to be too aggressive. It's looking pretty good. All right, now I'm going to move up to my micro bevel. The micro bevel has a really steep 60 degree front bevel angle. And the reason for that is it allows me to introduce the bevel and the cutting edge while the tools clear and free away from the rim right now. If you notice, I'm, I'm not up against the rim. If I were trying to make the cut right there with my 55 degree bevel swept back, the tool's gonna be rubbing the rim and it's, it's not gonna make the best angle for the pass across the bottom of this bowl. Instead, you can see with the 60 degree, it's 60, 65, it depends on how you wanna sharpen yours, but mine's around 60, 65 degrees and I can move across that bottom with the tool pointing almost straight in. It allows me to get into, especially with a closed rim bowl like this, allows me to get into that center very easily. Just make light passes and remove this material a little slower than I would normally like to turn. But again, I'd rather not bounce the bowl across the floor again. Because at this point, it's definitely going to go flying into a million pieces because of, the, because of the fact that this wood is brittle. If this were live oak or hickory, the bowl that you're seeing right there, if it came off the lathe, it could, it could bounce and, and I could probably put it right back on. You probably couldn't find any scratches or dents. This, because it's brittle, it would, it would shatter into several pieces. So making light passes to sneak up on that total shape and the total curve of the bottom of the bowl. And we're looking at a couple hairs thickness and this is not very thick. And 
You want to stop frequently and check your thickness. All right, so now I'm going to do final sanding in here. We might actually get a bowl out of this after all. I think this is the point where I'm realizing there might actually be a bowl at the end of this project. <laughs> Again, check out the, my video all about sanding. You, can, I go into great detail explaining what I'm doing right here. Those center areas of the bowl, we do not want to sand that while the lathe's running. You want to sand that with the lathe off because you'll create all kinds of scratch marks in the center of the bowl. Instead, what I was doing there is sanding with the grain. And when you sand in the direction of the surface grain of the wood, you won't leave scratches in the wood. Okay, I'm going to put this disc on. This is a, this is a disc that's designed for twice turning, but it's the only one I've got this size. But it'll hold the piece in, in place fine. And I'm going to take my time and match up the center of this the best I can. Take your time. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to push the tailstock in there really far immediately because you're going to make a hole and that pin on the tailstock is going to want to keep going to that hole. Instead, just hold it very lightly and check and see how close it is to being true. And if it's not truly centered, then loosen it up and move it just a touch and then try it again. And then once you feel that it's real close to being truly centered, then apply some pressure with the tailstock. And I'm using push cuts again towards the headstock. This will reduce the stress on the, the connection so that the tailstock and the, the plate that I'm using don't release the bowl. <laughs> I don't want to release this bowl again until I'm done. When I'm done, then we can release it from the lathe. And I'll do the releasing. I don't want it doing it on its own because it likes to do things violently. All right, I'm using the half, my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge to create a concave area in the foot of this bowl. And what you can do is stop and put your tool across the foot. You should see that there's a concave little cup that you're creating inside there. This will allow the bowl to seat really well on a table or on a surface. You definitely don't want the, the bowl to be concave or convex and you and flat isn't good either because it'll wobble a lot of times when it's flat if you have a little concave curve into it like i do here it'll it'll make it sit a lot better on the surface all right i'm using my spindle detail gouge i'm just going to finish up that bottom curve and i'm going to work off this nub now if you're not comfortable with where you're at right now you can stop and just cut that nub off or you can sand it off what I like to do is go in here with a little bit of pressure and turn the lathe off and then apply more pressure and actually cut those fibers. So I'll take this down to a really small piece and then I will come inside here, I will push and then turn the lathe off and then cut those fibers and sever that nub off. Okay, it's, I think we're actually going to get a bowl. Now I'm going to sand the center area smooth. The nice thing about this cedar is it sands beautifully and it creates a really nice smooth finish. It's going to look great with some lacquer on it. I'm sanding this from both directions with the grain. When I say with the grain, I'm using the side of the disc and sanding with the grain so that I don't leave scratch marks. If you sand across the grain, you're going to leave scratch marks. Okay, so now I'm going to use my wood burning tool to sign the bottom of this bowl. This is interesting too because if you, I do a lot of green wood or wood that has moisture content in it still, and when I go to sign it, I usually have to take my wood burning tool and take the temperature up as high as it'll go to to leave a mark in the wet wood. This wood is very dry, and it burns very easily so I'm at a setting of like five on my wood burner which is probably the lowest setting I've ever signed on. All right and then I'm going to take my lathe and I'm going to cover it up. I use this as a quick little workstation to spray my lacquer and I don't want to get any lacquer on the lathe obviously. 
Although I've gotten plenty of other finishes on the lathe, and I'm sure there's there's some lacquer on here. And there she is. I'm going to use a pre-cat lacquer. This is a lacquer mix with the lacquer thinner. And I can spray that in this sprayer very easily. I use a low pressure, about 25 PSI. And this sprayer is actually really affordable, super simple to do. I get the pre-cat lacquer from a cabinet supply store that, that has the material. Look at that turquoise with that red wood. Wow, this is gorgeous. This turned out way better than I thought it was going to turn out. Well, actually, I thought I was going to scrap the whole project and this video because of it bouncing across the floor and those holes at one point. Look at that finish. And look at the colors. Wow, that's interesting. With the holes filled, they're not as ugly as they were when they were just holes. And they really make this piece interesting. How cool is that? Well, that was a happy surprise. This took me two and a half days to do, by the way. And it's probably one of my longer bowls. <laughs> well... There it is. I got to tell you, this little guy was a workout. And I think the end result turned out good. But wow, this bowl was a nightmare. This bowl blank with all the holes in it and with the brittle quality and the tenon shearing off, it really gave me a run for my money. I guess what you could say is that when you get a bag of lemons, you make lemonade. Well, that's what we did with this bowl. We made a really nice bowl from uh, a mediocre log. But the end result's pretty cool. I really like the turquoise, the way it contrasts with the red of the wood. The finish looks pretty good. I love the lacquer on this. Cedar has a really smooth surface, so just a few coats of lacquer will give a really nice shine on that nice smooth surface when you've sanded it really well. <sighs> yeah, this was a nightmare. <laughs> I'm glad it's done and I'm glad it turned out well. I really like the results. Tell me what you think. Leave me a comment below. Let me know if you learned anything from this. If you learned nothing else from this video, I hope you learned perseverance is important when we turn wood. And it's something we have to do when we're wood turners is we have to solve problems. When a bull blank comes off the lathe and the tenon is sheared clear off, well, you got to figure out what to do and you got to problem solve that. So. You just make another ten and it's no big deal. We had enough wood here. It changed the shape of the bull a little bit, but it wasn't horrible. Just make a minor adjustment and keep going. And the big thing is don't give up. There's going to be lots of struggles when you're turning wood. You're going to have lots of problems and issues, things that happen that, you're, that are unexpected. Some of them can be scary. You get some nasty catches and things like that. But you just work through it and you keep moving. And before long, you're going to be making the bulls that you can imagine. All right, leave me a comment below. I greatly appreciate that. And if you haven't already, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen. YouTube sees you clicking that like button and it helps this video, it helps the channel, and it helps everything. So if you could click that like button, I would greatly appreciate it. If you haven't had a chance already, check out my website, turnawoodbull.com. If you're even remotely interested, or if you've been turning wood bulls for a long time, I've got great information for you there. You're going to want to check it out, turnawoodbull.com. All right, guys, like I finish all of my articles on my website and all of my videos, until next time, happy turning.